There are many versions explaining the nature of the mysterious explosion that occurred on June 30, 1908 near the Podkamenia Tunguska River. The power of the explosion was between 40 and 50 megatons, which corresponds to the explosion of a hydrogen bomb. None of the natural versions put forward over the years, comet, meteorite, methane cloud explosion, antimatter clot, explains all the oddities of this confusing case. It wasn't a meteorite. In the 1950s, the hypothesis of the artificial nature of the Tunguska object became unexpectedly popular within the scientific community. This hypothesis was first proposed in 1945 by the famous Soviet writer A.P. Kazantsev. After the news of the atomic bombing of Hiroshima, the writer suggested that an alien spaceship with an atomic engine had crashed over the taiga. It would seem that such a fantastic hypothesis was eventually to sink into oblivion, but it turned out to be exactly the opposite. In 1959, geophysicist A.V. Zeloto determined that the fallout of the forest on Tunguska was not caused by the explosion of a mysterious object in the atmosphere itself. This ruled out the possibility that the Tunguska body was an ordinary meteorite. Similar results were obtained by Soviet specialists back in 1949 during a secret expedition conducted on the personal orders of Beria, who supervised the atomic project. Affairs are secret. S.P. Potapov, who worked in those years under I.V. Kurchatov, the head of the Soviet atomic program. It turns out that one year after the test of the first Soviet atomic bomb, Beria made a proposal, at a secret meeting, to organize an expedition to the area of the Tunguska meteorite fall. The members of the expedition had a specific task, to evaluate the parameters of the explosion and compare them with the results of atomic tests. A characteristic moment Beria was not interested in the testimony of eyewitnesses. Moreover, the expedition members were strictly forbidden to question the local population about the events of 1908. Even before the expedition began, Beria demanded to collect information about the geophysical effects that accompanied the explosion over the Siberian taiga. And a reconnaissance plane with photo equipment twice flew over the alleged meteorite impact site at different altitudes, filming the configuration of the forest fallout. The expedition determined that the collapse of the forest was not caused by a ballistic wave of the Tunguska object, which moved at a height of 10 to 20 kilometers at a speed of about 1 to 2 kilometers per second, but by a shock wave from its explosion. The trees bore traces of faint radiation burns. However, the radioactivity only slightly exceeded the natural background in places. But after an atomic explosion, radioactive contamination of the area must necessarily be observed. Military specialists suggested that they were dealing with a clean high-power thermonuclear explosion, during which practically no radioactive substances were produced. The Tunguska explosion aroused the keen interest not only of Soviet atomic specialists. In 1942, residents of the Tunguska taiga detained a suspicious man. Calling himself a geologist, he was asking for directions to the site of the meteorite fall and offered money for information. The Russians at the time paid the local population not with useless paper money in the forest, but with bullets, vodka, and groats. Quickly realizing that the man was not who he said he was, the vigilant natives turned him in to the authorities. It turned out that the phony geologist was a researcher at a Berlin institute that dealt with problems of mysticism. Nothing more was learned about him, the detainee hanged himself in his cell. The mention of the Berlin Institute evokes a direct association with the famous German occult institute Annenerb. In addition to mysticism, specialists of Annenerb supervised projects in the Third Reich to create weapons of retaliation, one of which was the program to create an atomic bomb. The devil is in the details. Analysis of the destruction of the forested area caused by the Tunguska explosion suggests that at the end of the flight, that is, immediately before the explosion, the object was moving almost strictly from east to west. At the same time, eyewitnesses show that the object flew in the general direction from south to north. The divergence of directions of these two segments of the trajectory suggests that the direction of movement of the Tunguska body during the flight changed. The famous Soviet mathematician and astronomer F.Y.U. Siegel concluded in 1969 the Tunguska body maneuvered not only along the azimuth, but also along the height, moving not with monotonically decreasing, but with a complex changing speed. 
it is clear that a natural object could not perform such maneuvers. Following some researchers, we can assume that there were several Tunguska bodies that converged at the point of explosion. But this version, again, makes one speak of their artificial nature. As you know, the devil is in the details. Let's pay attention to several unusual events, which happened shortly before the Tunguska explosion. Who warned the Evenks? It is known that only reindeer and wild animals suffered from the Tungus explosion. The lack of human casualties was due to the low population density in the area. This is true, but only in part. Sometime before the explosion, local elders warned residents to avoid visiting the area where the god of Agda must descend. The area north of Sharoma was declared off-limits, it was recommended that the many strategically important trails for the nomadic reindeer herders be moved aside. Specially delegated shamans went to the Evenks, who had settled in seclusion near the future epicenter of the coming of Agda, and persuaded them to leave their settled places. It is possible to suppose that shamans were guided by the observation of atmospheric anomalies, which were registered not only over the taiga, but also in different parts of the globe starting from May 1908. However, how did the shamans know about the area of the future explosion? It is quite obvious that someone not only warned them, but, what is much more important, informed them of the exact coordinates of the impact area. The following curious fact A.V. Zeloto discovered in the autobiographical notes of the writer Vyacheslav Shishkov. In 1911, as an employee of the Omsk Department of Land and Waterways, Shishkov led an expedition that worked near the territory of the Tunguska explosion. A local postmaster told him that a month before the disaster, unknown people with strange metal boxes had appeared in the Tunguska region. The strangers clearly avoided contact with the local population and went into the taiga without even taking a guide with them. The postmaster saw them a second time, six months later, a mysterious expedition was on its way to the railway station. Could this expedition have been involved in the Tunguska event? It is believed that by 1908 mankind already had everything necessary to carry out an experimental atomic explosion. A thermonuclear bomb in 1908? The penetrating ionizing radiation emitted by uranium compounds, later called radiation by Marie Curie, was discovered by French physicist Antoine Henri Becquerel in 1896, and radium and polonium were discovered in 1902. The following year, 1903, Becquerel and the Curies were awarded the Nobel Prize. And in the same year, Ernest Rutherford and Frederick Soddy created the theory of the decay of atomic nuclei. This indirectly shows that in some scientific centers, secret work on the mastery of atomic energy was going on in parallel. One could argue that Curie's and Becquerel's discoveries dealt only with natural radioactivity, and that chain reactions with the release of free neutrons were unknown to them. But the splitting of uranium atoms by bombarding them with free neutrons was carried out in 1938 by the German physicist Otto Hahn by almost exactly repeating the experiments of Irene Joliot Curie, daughter of Marie and Pierre Curie, whose methodology may well have been passed on to her by her parents. We should not forget that Becquerel worked with samples of pure uranium as early as May 1886, which means that even then there were methods of obtaining it. History suggests that there could have been other alternative ways of solving this problem. In 1937, one of the most famous alchemists of the XX century, Fulcanelli, visited the laboratory of the Paris Gas Society, where nuclear research was conducted under the direction of Professor André Heilbronner. During the conversation, he uttered the following words. Achieving the release of nuclear energy is easier than you think. The artificial radioactivity caused by it could poison the atmosphere of the entire planet in a few years. In addition, atomic explosives, which can be extracted from just a few grams of metal, are capable of destroying entire cities. I'm telling you straightforwardly, alchemists have known this for a long time. I know that you will tell me that alchemists did not know the structure of the nucleus, did not know electricity, did not know any way to detect it, so they could not make any transformation, could never release atomic energy. Let me just inform you without proof, the geometric arrangement of ultra-pure substances is sufficient to unleash atomic forces without the use of electricity and vacuum techniques. If the alchemists really possessed the recipe for a more economical way to unleash atomic forces, did they not possess an equally economical way to initiate pure thermonuclear reactions? And if they possessed this secret, 
couldn't someone else have used it? For, as the German proverb says, was wissens by wischwein, that is, what to know, a pig knows. What do you think about it? I'm waiting for your suggestions in the comments. Subscribe to the channel and share this video with your friends. Give it a thumbs up. Tell us interesting facts you know about the topic of this video. See you in new videos.